Now I would like for you to give a warm welcome to Abdu Murray. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's tremendous to be with you all in this uh, gorgeous, beautiful setting. Um, if you don't believe in God, just watch, uh, look out the windows, and you will. Um, it's quite something to see around here, how much the gorgeous beauty around here really does inspire someone uh, to uh, be thinking spiritual and heavenly things, and I'm sure I'm not the first person this summer to say such a thing. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you to Bob and Paul and all the board members for having me and my wife, Nicole, uh, who's here with me, uh, be able to enjoy this beautiful setting and spend some time with you. This is my third time, my third go at it. Um, uh, hopefully I'll get it right this time. Um, uh, and uh, maybe you'll invite me back. But it's, uh, I, I want to speak about a kind of a, a heavy topic, if you don't mind my doing so. I do think that church is the kind of place where heavy topics should be explored, not just light and lively things, but heavy topics as well, especially given the current state of affairs. But I do want to start off a little on the light side. There's a story, uh, it's, a, it's a joke that was um, uh, told by Emo Phillips a long time ago that I think really is paradigmatic of what we're going through in the world today. Um, and it's uh, talk about the, the condition of our hearts and the willingness to divide so easily over little things. So he tells the story of a guy he saw on a bridge about to jump. So he, and he tells from the first person, he says, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? And he said, I'm a Christian. I said, me too, Protestant or Catholic? And he said, Protestant. I said, me too, what franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too, Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? And he said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too, Northern Baptist, Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? And he says, Northern Conservative Baptist. And I said, me too, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist, Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region Council of 1879, or Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region of 1912. I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him. <laughs> There's a little bit of sadness to that joke, isn't there? I think we divide so easily over things. You know, the, it, there's a story it's kind of humorous because of the denominationalism and all this kind of stuff. This is really a picture, I think, of Western culture, especially in the political sphere, but also in the social and uh, cultural spheres as well. You know, we tend to divide so easily. You have this whole thing called call-out culture and cancel culture, where someone can be within the tribe, and they're a part of the team. But the minute they say something that's a little bit different than what the, the mob at the at particular moment likes, die, heretic, and we excommunicate them, we get rid of them. This is, by the way, not a phenomenon that's limited to them, whoever them is, by the way. Us does it just as well. We do it just as well, sometimes better. Um, <clears throat> but it's a world that's divided. It's a world where there's so much turmoil because of the willingness to divide and the eagerness to see, almost to see friends fall and to see friends divided and, and just be right and have this warlike mentality. It's a very strange thing. But in the middle of all the cultural turmoil, and there's lots of things, by the way, not just division amongst people, but there's ideologies and there's isms and there's schisms and there's various things you want to talk about all the time. <clears throat> there's this air of sense of, we got to do something about this. And sometimes we think it's to beat them, to win to win at all costs, whoever them happens to be, whatever political spectrum you happen to be on, or side of the political spectrum you happen to be on, or cultural issues, we sort of want to beat them. It's get them, whatever it is. If I, honestly, if I see one more video where a conservative or a liberal person destroys a questioner, I'm just going to vomit, I, I think, seriously. It's like, how many times can we watch that video? Um, now, there's times when we need to have truth spoken, sometimes in sharp ways. But oftentimes what we have to do is have an air of persuasion about us that I think calls us to something a little bit higher. Maybe not just fancy words, maybe not just gotcha moments, maybe not these things. Maybe it's a call to see the common good again, to see the public good and speak for the good of the public, even if it's not for the good of my immediate situation. There's a story of a monk years ago, centuries ago, even millennia ago, <clears throat> in the, uh, the early, oh, the, the early church years. So a few years after the, a few centuries after the birth of the church, there was a Christian monk named Telemachus, or Telemachus is how you actually pronounce it. 
And the story has some variations to it based on the traditions, but I'm going to tell you the most common version of the story. All the facts are pretty much um, uh, confirmed, but there's a couple of variations on the facts. But Telemachus had heard that the Roman emperor, after the uh, abolition of the gladiatorial games, a new Roman emperor had come in. And he was a pagan emperor, and he had come in and he had reinstituted the gladiatorial games for various reasons. And he couldn't believe his ears. He could not believe. They started this up again, this whole gladiatorial thing where people were coming in, and, and, but the masses for this, to satisfy this weird bloodlust, and somehow that placated people so that they wouldn't revolt against Rome. So they instituted the gladiatorial uh, games again in Rome, and it was just an abomination to Telemachus. So he goes to Rome to see if this is actually true for himself. And he's a sort of an aesthetic guy. He, he's, he's a hermit. He kind of is a secluded guy. He goes to Rome, wowed by the, the just uh, hugeness of Rome and the decadence in Rome once again. Had, he had heard it was slaked for a while, but it's back again. And he goes to the Colosseum, and lo and behold, there it is. The gladiatorial games are happening. And he is stunned. And as he's working his way through just a bloodthirsty crowd, he's yelling the, the phrase, in the name of Christ, stop this. In the name of Christ, stop this. And he's getting himself down, down, down towards the sand of the Colosseum floor. And he hops over the, the, the barrier between the audience and the Colosseum floor. And he jumps in between the gladiators and he says, in the name of Christ, stop this. Now there's two versions of the story. One version of the story has Telemachus run through with a spear right by one of the gladiators. And as he's dying, he's yelling, in the name of Christ, stop this. Another version of the story has the audience turn on Telemachus and starts throwing things at Telemachus to the point where he gets so injured that he dies on the sands of the Colosseum saying the words, sort of like Stephen in one way, he's saying, in the name of Christ, stop this. The story I'm telling you here, and there's an ending to the story I'm going to share with you in a moment, but the story I'm telling you here is a story where someone saw an atrocious evil, and they didn't go on a campaign to discredit or demean the people who were espousing that evil. He saw a need to shout the truth but sacrifice himself in the process. I don't know if we have that kind of a culture going on right now. If we do have it, I think it's in the minority. Telemachus was in the minority. He was in the minority. But what do we do? What do we do? You know, it's, it's interesting when you look at the various ways in which we think about culture now, we have these icons of culture and phrases like the golden rule, which is already read to you, but we have this golden rule that we say all the time. You know, there's a bunch of phrases from the Bible that people often think are just phrases that came out of thin air, so to speak, or were culturally derived, like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you, and these kind of things, or things like the good Samaritan. And you see, sometimes you'll be on the side of the road, and you'll see a van that says good Samaritan, and it's from CVS, the pharmacy. And I wonder, did the people who painted the side of that van even know what a good Samaritan actually is? And why it's a Samaritan who's a part of the story? Why the people, a people, the Samaritans, who Israel hates at the time of Jesus telling the parable of the good Samaritan, becomes the hero of a story to convict people that you have to help people even when they hate you. Because that's what God himself did. The Good Samaritan story is not just about being a good neighbor. It's actually a story about the incarnate Christ, the one who the world hated, who came in and helped people even if it meant his death. So you, you hear these phrases, the Good Samaritan story, go the extra mile. That's a Jesus phrase. We sort of appropriate these things into our culture, but we don't really live them anymore. And they were revolutionary when Jesus said them. 2,000 years later, now they're kitsch. Now it's just, you know, whatever. Um, which is an interesting thing to me. And so I want to point out, there's a, a, if you go to the United Nations building in New York, I don't know if you've been there before, but if you go there, there's a tour you can do. And apart from the General Assembly Room with the UN ambassadors and the secretary generals and all that, where they meet, apart from that room being the most popular attraction, there's a, there's a thing called the Good Samaritan Mosaic. And this is a picture of it. It's really something. It's, it's the most popular attraction at the UN building. This is a mosaic made of a bunch of little stones that are, is based on a painting by the artist, the American artist, Norman Rockwell. And you can see in his inimitable style, he has this incredible set of detail and he captures the moment so well, yet there's a softness even to the detail that he has there. And so this mosaic 
And it's huge. You can see the plaque right here gives you a scale for how big this thing actually is. So it's a painting that's become a stone mosaic. And it's at the UN building, and you can see what it depicts, people from different religious cultures, different um, uh, ethnic issues, standing together in various areas of contemplation. Some have needs, some have prayer, some have people with them, some are caring for other people, and engraved, you can barely see it here, but engraved right into the mosaic are the words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule is literally the most popular attraction at the UN building. Remarkable. But as if to disprove the point of the state of culture, the mosaic cracked. It cracked so badly that it needed restoration. And because the message is so valuable, because the message is so keen, because the artistry, but also the, method, the message that, that stimulated the artistry was so important, the UN did what they needed to do to restore the mosaic back to its glory. Like I said, quite poetic that the idea that we should do unto others as we would have done unto us cracked. Culture is in the same boat, obviously. You know, it's interesting. During the rededication ceremony, the then UN de uh, sec uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, of the UN, Jan Eliasson, said at the dedication ceremony, when this thing had been restored to its glory, he said this about the mosaic and the message behind the mosaic. He says, it represents or reflects the very essence of our mission as set forth in our charter. At its core, the work of the UN and the work that this has inspired is about narrowing the gap between the world as it is and the world as we want it to be. It's about narrowing the gap between the world as it is, the divided, cracked world, and the world as we want it to be, a cohesive place where we do unto others as we would have done unto us. And that's exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. It's interesting, though, because he adds a little something extra to the end of it that we don't typically do because we want to make it a cliche that everyone can say, no matter what your religious beliefs are. But of course, he says, this is the law and the prophets. This sums up all of it. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. You know, with a couple of exceptions, various worldviews, religious and secular worldviews, have a version of this. They have different versions of this. Uh, Islam, for example, has a version where it basically says is that, that uh, don't do bad things to people and bad things won't be done to you. Uh, from Hindu and Buddhist and Eastern philosophies, there's something, something similar. It's like, when you do good things, good things will happen. When you do bad things, bad things will happen. Sort of the lot of karma. Um, you have this in various other views, uh, with, whether it's Confucius or Taoism or various forms of animism out throughout the, the South, whether it's in uh, South America or in, uh, in Africa. You also see versions of this, even secular versions of the golden rule. Golden rule things saying like, you know, the social contract. If you contract and you agree to do good things for people, people will do good things for you. And if you agree not to harm others, then they won't harm you. So there's this sentiment that's sort of a universal sentiment, you know, let's do good things to people that we would want done unto us. And, you know, it'll, it'll sort, of, sort of form the social contract of society. This is what Locke and Hobbes and all these guys picked up on. We see this all the time. Yet in our modern day, right now, sitting today, with all the technology we have and all the interconnectedness we've had, we've never been more connected. I mean, you realize that the little thing that's in your pocket we call it a phone for whatever reason. People don't make calls on these things anymore, but we call them phones still. Um, this phone, my one phone, not all of them put together, but this one has more computing power than all of the computers put together that sent the first rockets to the moon. Do you realize that? That this one phone has more power in it than all of mission control back in the 60s? That's remarkable. So this thing connects us to the world, and yet we've never been more fractured. We've never been angry at each other. Maybe it's because we're so connected. I don't know. But it caused Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi at, um, uh, of the UK, former chief rabbi of the UK, he wrote an article called The Politics of Anger. And this is what he says. I'm going to only quote us a fraction of it for you, but it's important you hear his words. From Jonathan Sachs, what we are witnessing throughout the West is a new politics of anger. 
There is a widespread feeling that the world in the 21st century is running out of control. This has led in France, Greece, Austria, Hungary, and Poland, and I would also say the United States, to a resurgence of the far right. Elsewhere, including the United States, there is an emerging alliance of the far left and radical political Islam. These are dangerous forces. The far right seeking to return to a golden age that never was, the far left in pursuit of a utopia that will never be. They are both enemies of freedom. They are both enemies of freedom because they trade on anger. They trade on suspicion. They trade on hatred. No matter how anti-hate they claim to be, they certainly do trade on quite a bit of it. He goes on to point out, Jonathan Sachs goes on to point out, that this anger in the way we deal with each other essentially is based on two really important things, really important facts, is that we have deep differences, and that's fine. We have to wrestle with our differences, but we don't disagree agreeably. We disagree disagreeably. We can't wait to vanquish our opponents. And we need to recover an objective sense, an objective sense of morality. In other words, what he's saying, something is objective, of course, if it's true, it's, something is objectively true, even if no one believes it, or if everyone believes it. Like, the world is round. It's a ball. I know for whatever reason now, and I got to tell you, this is a little shocking to me. I go to places, and people say, well, you know, there's evidence that the world is flat. There is no evidence the world is flat. <clears throat> I'm going to settle that one right now. Um, it's a ball. Even when no one believed it, it was a ball. That's objectively true. It's independent of human opinion. What Sachs is saying, and what I think is important for us to do, is recover a sense of objective morality, a morality that does not depend on human opinion. It might depend on human ability to see what it actually is. That's ability of, uh, our ability to discover it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. And that transcendent, objective source of morality has to come from something that's not us. Because if it comes from us, then it is based on our opinion. And I don't know if you've looked at history to notice this, but we're terrible at this. If the history of the world has shown us anything, is the more advanced we get, the more sort of new devilry we've figured out how to work on each other. I mean, even this machine. Again, I want you to just pause for a moment. More connectivity than ever. You can get any answer you want to almost any question, and by the way, be subject to a bunch of misinformation and disinformation on this little machine. And we name them now. We call it Siri or Alexa or whatever other names they're coming up with. You know, um, for the AI also that generates some of the responses to some of this stuff. We give it names. We give it endearing names. We talk to it like it's a person. Yet it's just a machine. You're not going to hurt its feelings. You're not going to give it some sense of meaning because you talk to it. And yet, we take these machines that we have now humanized and we've used them to objectify human beings. Whether it's through pornography, cyberbullying, or cancel culture on Twitter or whatever else it might be. Because we've lost the sense of objective morality, but I would dare say it's even further than that. I think we have lost the sense of what it means to be human. And so what was once the civil public square, where ideas could be exchanged, sometimes vehemently, sometimes adamantly, sometimes with raised voices, but it was still the civil public square. The civil public square has now been transformed into the Colosseum that men like Telemachus had to die in, in order to raise the question of the evil of it. That's what's happening now. I mean, gut check for each one of us, heart check for each one of us, how often do we look at the YouTube videos hoping that our side demolishes the other person and makes them look like fools? It's one thing to look at ideas. It's another thing to look at people in a way that should devalue them. How did we get here? I think the way we got here, and by the way, I'm an optimist, so it's going to get optimistic in a little bit, I promise. It will, I promise. How did we get here? It's important we see how we got here, though, because you can't diagnose the problem. So you can't fix the problem until you actually diagnose the situation. And I think the way we got here is we lost the ability to see each other as human because we've lost the ability to even know what it means to be human. You see what I'm saying here? You can't look at another person as a human being if you don't understand what it means for someone to be human in the first place, or even yourself to be human in the first place. It's very, very difficult. It's very difficult because, you see, what's going on in, in culture right now, and it's been happening to young people for quite some time, 
our generation, and most of you are my generation or are slightly older, uh, some of you are slightly younger, um, we handed off something to the younger generation. Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha now have been handed off something, a bunch of wonderful things that our generations have collectively passed off to them. It's great. A couple of things that aren't so awesome. And you know what one of the things that the young people are hearing today? They're hearing two impossible to, re to reconcile but equally stated things at the same time. Statement number one, you are a meat computer. You're just software in a, in a, in a, in a wet machine, essentially. You just respond to external stimuli because you're a biochemical machine, and that's all you are. At best, you are a sophisticated chimp. That's what young people are here, okay? You're not really special because you're human. You're just another form of primate like other ones. At the same time, they're hearing a, 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 a totally opposite, but equally stated, sometimes by the same people, statement, you are the god of your own universe. You can dictate reality as you like. You can demand that other people agree with your form of reality as well. You know, and these things are very, very popular, and they're, and, and they're stated by some of our most brilliant intellectuals sometimes at the same time. You know, <clears throat> I went to, when I was in law school, we studied a lot of different opinions by some of the most famous jurists in Western jurisprudence. One of them was Richard Posner. Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, a former a retired uh, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals judge in the Federal Circuit, was one of the most brilliant jurists there were. I remember studying his opinions and looking at his opinions, and then later on, even though I was practicing in the Sixth Circuit in the, in the Detroit area, I would quote Judge Posner, even though his opinions weren't considered binding authority, because people respected Judge Posner so much, whether you were on this side or that side of the political spectrum, his brilliance couldn't be denied. And so I saw a video that was on YouTube, and it was an interview with Judge Posner about his judicial philosophy, and I was like, I cannot wait to watch this video. And I was in utter, complete, anticlimactic letdown when he talked about the basis of his judicial philosophy. And this is what he said. He said, I basically think we're just monkeys with big brains. That's it. And I was so let down by this because here's a man who's influenced jurisprudence in America, for good or for ill, depending on your views, but so profoundly. And I remember thinking, this man, as a judge, was part of the noble profession of law, where you take the disputes of human beings who are sometimes in their most dire circumstances and, and, and has an impact on policy that will exist and also impact human beings for generations to come. This noble profession where you seek the blindness of justice so that people aren't favored based on their economic or social or religious or political or racial status, none of these things, and you seek to adjudicate the affairs of human beings in the courses of their lives. The nobility of that, he reduced to being a zookeeper who keeps the monkeys from biting each other. But at the same time, there's a self-aggrandizement. And I've written about this quite extensively in, in, in my book, Saving Truth but I've also talked about it, and I will be talking about it in a forthcoming book as well. There's a self-aggrandizement that happens now in the current cultural climate where I become the god of my own skull-sized world because feelings and preferences matter more than facts and truth. And facts and truth, when they don't matter as much as feelings and preferences, that has the, the, the effect of me as the autonomous ruler of my own world saying my feelings and my preferences can supersede biology, it can supersede science, it can supersede social realities, it can supersede uh, laws that are, are, are meant to bring fairness and equity between people of different, different situations. It can supersede all of that. And by the way, since I am the god, the sovereign god of my own autonomous skull-sized world, you have to have no other gods before me. But here's the problem, friends. I am, you have the same exact rights that I do. And you have the same sovereignty in your own skull-sized world as I do. And if your preferences and my preferences happen to conflict, the problem is going to be that truth won't decide who's right and who's wrong anymore. It won't be a civil public square. It'll be a gladiator arena. And that's what it's become. That is exactly what it's become. And so here is what I would say to you. We've lost the idea of what it means to be human because we've reduced it either to the idea that you are just a meat computer or a sophisticated primate, or you are the god of your own skull-sized world, and your sovereignty is not based on truth, it's based solely on feelings. Both of those things are tangentious at best. 
Both of those things are tenuous at best, and they don't have any real foundation to them. So when you look at someone, you naturally look at them as if they are a person who is equated with their ideas. I want you to hear me on this. This is very important, because I think this is the core of the problem. This is the core of the problem. We have now equated people as a value of a person with the value of the ideas they have. What your ideas are is who you are. How do I, why do I feel like that? Because that's how I feel about myself. My proclivities, my preferences, whatever it might be, that is the sum total of who I am. The traumas I experienced, that's the total. That's all of it. How I feel is what I am now, which means that if you make me feel a certain way, and if it's bad, I get to hate you because I define you by hatred. I define you by your political ideas. And so I can disagree and then devalue your idea and at the same time devalue you. So is it any wonder now that we decide to decimate each other and hurt each other? You know, I want to take this on a personal note here and maybe say something that may be a little self-indicting, but it's important we do it. A few weeks ago, there was an assassination attempt on a presidential candidate. And I don't know if you noticed what was, ha- what was trending on Twitter. I noticed, did a whole video on it. It was a hashtag, and the hashtag was, how'd you miss? And there were jokes being made by various comedians about how th- if only the guy had been trained better. It's one of the first times, or one of the only times I can think of, in the past 15, 20 years, where people were lamenting that a mass shooting didn't have a body count of one more. Same time, friends, same time, a few weeks before that, we all watched a debate where a man with obvious cognitive decline did a very, very poor job. And most of us, I'm not saying you, I'm just saying the country, watched hoping he would embarrass himself and then gleefully told jokes after he did. If it was my grandfather, I would not want jokes told about the man. We equated the value of a person with the value of the idea they have. And if the idea is abhorrent and should be done away with, then the person should be done away with. Donald Trump and Joe Biden are both made in the image of God. And they are people for whom Christ died. And yet, this is what happens. This is what's going on. How do we get out of the situation? How do we do it? I think there's hope. I really do, because we used to have a sense of what it meant to be human. And we've been asking this question for millennia now. I want to read from the scriptures, uh, uh, Psalm 8, verses 4 to 8. You know, and the very fact that we actually ask this question, I want to pause for a moment and say this. The very fact that we even ask the question, what does it mean to be human, gives a clue as to what it means to be human. Because, you know, you don't have apes sitting around asking about apehood They're not sitting around thinking as they peel their bananas, boy, could we have a better life than this? You know, let's let's form a government and have a democracy of this. That's that's how it works. There's an alpha, there's a beta, and there's everybody else. They don't sit around wondering what Saturn's Saturn's rings are made out of. They don't sit around thinking about their origins. They don't do that. We do. And it's not just an epiphenomenon of evolution. We ask these deep questions, and so in Psalm Psalm 8, verses 4 to 8, David asks, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet and sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. You see what David is saying here is he's asking the question, what is humanity that you are mindful of him? Because we're not just sophisticated chimps, and meat computers, nor are we the gods of the universe that the society is claiming us to be. We're something exactly in the middle. The Bible tends to resolve the issue by saying, you've both got it wrong. If you're half right that we're sovereign, you're all wrong because you think that we're the sovereign. If you're believing that we're biological mechanisms, that's true, but you're half right, which means you're all wrong because we're right in the middle. And Genesis 127 says that we are made in God's image. We're not God himself, but we have something of the divine in us, given to us by something that's not us. And so I don't have the authority 
as a human being who's made in God's image to look at another human being who's also made in God's image, an image I did not give them and have no power to take away, and neither does the government, I don't have the right to look at that person, no matter what it is they say, think, feel, or do, and say, you are less than me. And if you're a Christian and you're in this room, and you believe that you have a savior who saved you from your sins, the very essence of what it means to be a Christian is to look at someone and say, I deserved hell. But I don't, I don't, I'm not going there because of someone who's not me, who saved me from me. And that person is the same, same, in the same position you are, no matter what their ideas are, no matter what they are. We need to recover this sense of what it means to be human once again and divorce ourselves from this idea that the value of someone's ideas are the equivalent of the value of the person. You know, a colleague of mine way, way back was having a meeting with some of the senior leaders and officials of Hamas. Long time ago, he had a, 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 a meeting with them, and the Hamas leader asked him this question, what's the difference, the chief difference, because he's a Christian, he says, to the, so the Muslim guy from Hamas asked uh, my Christian colleague, what is the main difference between what you and I believe? And he, of course, there's many big differences. But my colleague said this to him. He said, here's the big difference. When you see someone, your religion requires you to equate the value of someone's beliefs with the value of the person themselves. So if they say something that you consider blasphemous, you equate that blasphemy with the value of the person who said the blasphemy, which means when you hear blasphemy, you are required to kill them because that person has lost all value because their ideas don't have value. As a Christian, I can tell you, I see people as made in God's image, which means no matter what value they have, sorry, no, no, no matter what idea they have, their value remains the same because their ideas don't dictate their values and my view of their ideas don't dictate their values, which is why I ought not to kill them. What I'm required to do is lovingly come alongside them and try to show them how much God loves them and that God's way is a better way even than their idea might be, even if I find it completely repugnant. You view the idea and the person as the same. I view the person as made in God's image no matter what their ideas actually are. That's the first thing, is to recover a sense of what it means to be human, to be made in God's image. The second thing, friends, is to hold fast to transcendent truths that stand above party platforms and social trends. Stand fast to transcendent truths that stand above party platforms and social trends, and then try our best to get party platforms and social trends to actually comply, and our policies to comply with those transcendent truths in loving and important ways. You know, it's interesting. I looked at uh, and just uh, a couple of quotes from a, a, an Italian atheist senator. He's retired long now. He might even be passed away. His name is Marcello Pera. And Marcello Pera was talking about the value of transcendent Christian truth. He's an atheist now, speaking about the value of transcendent Christian truth that's foundational to the West. And he, is, he, 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 he mentions a woman named Madame Maillard, Madame Maillard was an uh, opera singer and an actress who uh, was uh, during a, a ceremony in front of Notre Dame where they were sort of basically saying, we're done with the Catholic Church and we're ushering in an age of reason. She became the goddess of reason at this ceremony at Notre Dame during the French Revolution in the 1790s. <clears throat> and so she was this goddess of reason and Madame Maillard said, liberté, égalité, fraternité, freedom, equality, and brotherhood, as if those were the ideals of reason and not of religion. And this is what Marcelo Pera says. He says, have the concepts of liberté, égalité, and fraternité been, by any chance, been by, invented by Madame Maillard? Or is it rather the, the case that the pretty French actress recited in her own way lines read from the Gospels? Does not this old-fashioned book teach that men are sons of God, created in his image, and therefore free, equal and united by the same destiny? True, it took a long time and many troubles and tragedies to understand this message, but that just means that the Enlightenment was late, not that it was new. The Enlightenment didn't give us these ideas. The Enlightenment borrowed from the Bible to give us these ideas. And then Marcelo Pera goes on, Marcelo Pera goes on to say that honestly, if we recover a sense of what it means to be Christian, or even fake it, like say you're a Christian but not really mean it, and live like one, 
which I think is a bad idea in one sense, but this is what he says. In the end, we must choose, as the history of liberalism and modernity shows, the Christian choice to give oneself to God or to act as if God existed have yielded the best results. This choice still has great advantages also in the field of public ethics. If we live as Christians, we will be wiser and more aware of the dangers we face. We will not separate morality from truth. We will not confuse moral autonomy with any free choice. We will not treat individuals, whether the unborn or the dying, as things. We will not allow all desires to be transformed into rights. We will not confine reason within the boundaries of science, nor will we feel alone in a society of strangers or oppressed by the state that appropriates us because we no longer know how to guide ourselves. Listen now how he ends it up. He says, our moral norms and with them our coexistence and all the institutions, the very same ones that have passed down and preserved us for the civilization in which we are now living, at times troubled and ineffective, at times satisfied and hopeful, these things would wither and die if they were to cut themselves off from Christianity. This is an atheist talking. We recover that sense of transcendent truth as the underpinning and the foundations of the institutions we hope will build a better world and a, and a public good for all of us. Recognizing first what it means to be human and treating each other as if that were actually true. And then two, seeing the transcendent truths that underline the ideas of liberty, equality, and unity. We see that transcendent truth once again. You know, <clears throat> my alma mater was already stated, University of Michigan undergraduate and law school. And um, uh, my wife too is a Spartan. So um, we have a divided household. Um, uh, my son is a Spartan. Um, and uh, my, my, my middle daughter is going off to Grand Valley in the fall, uh, in a, like next week actually. And um, I got one more shot at a Wolverine. That was my third. Um, we'll see. But we won the national championship, so I don't care what happens anymore uh, <laughs> about that. But as I was uh, walking as an undergraduate, before I became a Christian, years before I became a Christian, and I was considering the claims of Christianity and other things, I walked by Angel Hall quite often. This is a, a picture of Angel Hall. It's one of the most uh, oldest buildings at University of Michigan, but also a pretty important one. Um, and etched in the concrete, you can't really see it here, but that statement at the top, it's, it's etched in the concrete just below the statement. I remember walking by that several times and looking at it, and it says, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall be forever encouraged. Religion, morality, and knowledge, that triad of things put, put together, are necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. I don't know if you went to the University of Michigan or been by it or waved past it or smelled Ann Arbor on a drive through. I don't know. Or whatever it might be. Or if you've been to a secular university anytime soon. I don't know if you're aware of this. Religion's not a huge thing there. Conservatism and conservative Christianity, not exactly like, hey, come on, let's have a party and talk about your beliefs. Um, it's not exactly welcome. And I remember, this is, when the, this is in the 90s when I was walking past it, thinking to myself, as a Muslim, I wonder whose religion they mean. I wonder what morality is being talked about there. I wonder what form of knowledge. It's interesting to me. In fact, that, this quote formed the basis of my law school entrance essay. Um, <clears throat> and I remember thinking to myself, there's got to be a transcendent one, something they're referring to because it can't be based on human opinion, because we're so different. And yet, in one of the most liberal schools in the world, that is etched in stone. And they're not taking it down anytime soon. The transcendent truths that form our institutions and our platforms need to be recognized once again. Third, is to cultivate a posture of hopeful service and sacrificial service. And this is where the hope comes in, friends, because I think all this stuff is good. But really, it comes down to this. Cultivate a culture of hopeful and self-sacrificial service. You know, uh, my friend John Stone Street, who's spoken here this summer, he has an article talking about, you know, when we go to the voting booths, we think about we have, and this is the dismal part, we think about we have a choice between the lesser of two evils. We've been saying that for years. We really mean it this time. <laughs> this is the lesser of two evils. 
But he had an article where he talked about the difference between choosing between the lesser of two evils and voting to lessen evil. And I thought, that's profound. And we had a conversation on my podcast recently, and it's going to air pretty soon. Uh, we had a conversation, and one of the things I noticed, I don't think he intended this, but it was, it was something I noticed from this idea of lessening evil, is that when you look at your, the voting you're going to be doing, when you look at the social engagement you're going to be doing, no matter what it happens to be, whether it's in conversations one-on-one -on -one over lunch, whether it's in your various spheres of influence in your jobs and all those kind of things, or it's at the booth, if you think about, I got to go and vote for the lesser of two evils, that's so depressing and disappointing, and it seems nihilistic, and it seems pointless. Why am I even doing it? Walking in and lessening, uh, pick, uh, picking the lesser of two evils? But if you walk into that booth, or you have that conversation, or you spend your money, or whatever it is, in a way that sees yourself not as choosing the lesser of two evils, as if you're just choosing the less bad option, but anything you do actually goes toward the objective of lessening evil. Now you're doing something positive. Now you're doing something hopeful. So you're not basing it necessarily on the personality of the person you're, you're, you're voting for or the whatever it might be. You look at the whole thing of it and say, how can I act in a way that lessens evil? That is what the Christian is supposed to be doing in this world. We are supposed to know God and make him known. And one of the best ways to make him known is to act in a way that lessens evil in his name. It's a hopeful thing. So please... In a couple of months, let's reorient ourselves into thinking we're not just here to choose the lesser of two evils, whether it's on the national platform with regard to the presidential election or on the local platform with regard to the school board or whatever it might be. Let's go into the polls. Let's go into our conversations. Let's engage with our friends. Let's engage with our neighbors. Let's engage with our relatives in whatever form we're doing it, not with the idea of how do I pick the lesser of two evils, but think about hope and positivity, we are here to lessen evil. And then let's make an assumption. Make an assumption that the person you're talking to, no matter how much they disagree with you, also might be thinking, I'm trying to lessen evil and think of them in a different light. Maybe not as an enemy to be vanquished, but as a person made in God's image for whom Christ died. You know, I think about Telemachus again. Telemachus. Here's this tremendous evil that's happening in the Colosseum where people made in God's image are turned into objects of entertainment. <laughs> Just think about the debate. Objects of entertainment. Entertainment as politics is just not going to work. Telemachus goes and he sees this great evil and he's, he's appalled by it and he jumps in and he gets involved in the fray and he says, in the name of Christ, stop this and they run him through, or they stone him to death, and he dies, saying, in the name of Christ, stop this. Friends, the emperor was so moved that there was never a gladiator game ever again. I mentioned the golden rule before, of course, and it has its many forms, as I said before. You know, we think about this all the time. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. And we see different forms of it. You know, in, in addition to the, to the mosaic, the beautiful mosaic, there's a poster that was given, a little less impressive than a mosaic, but it was a poster that was given by the Interfaith Society to the UN. And it had the versions of the golden rule, from the Hindu versions and the Buddhist versions to the Islamic versions and the Zoroastrian versions and the atheistic versions as well. To say, hey, we all kind of believe the same thing. But remember what I said when I described those to you? They were slightly different. Those versions of the golden rule said things like, don't do bad things and bad things won't happen to you. Or do good things so that good things happen to you. Those are the different versions of the golden rule. And I want you to notice something. They're fundamentally different than the way Jesus actually expresses it. Jesus doesn't say, do good things and good things will happen to you in the golden rule. Or don't do bad things so bad things don't happen to you. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you irrespective of how they treat you. When you say, do good things so that good things will happen to you, that's self-seeking. When you say, do good, do, uh, don't do bad things so bad things won't happen to you, that's self-protective. 
But when you believe that you are here to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's Mm self-sacrificial. And the world moves when they see self-sacrifice. That's exactly what the cross is all about. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing, friends? Isn't it amazing that the word crucifixion has the Latin word crux as its root? And the crux is the place where everything comes together, the crux of the matter, the crux of the issue, the crux of history. It's the place where everything comes together, and the crux of a lever is where everything finally turns. You can move the world with a big enough lever and a strong enough crux. And the crucifixion is the crux of all of history. Where Jesus sees sinful people who hold horrible ideas and do horrible things as made in God's image, believing in the transcendent truth that God is both just and merciful and satisfies God's justice so that we can achieve God's mercy through Christ's atoning work on the cross because of God who loves all of us so much. This is the truth you stand on. This is how Christian character is formed in times of turmoil. I pray that each one of us gets inspired by this, to have a conversation, to know who this man is. And if you don't know who he is, and you don't know the, the, the impact that one Jewish peasant in a forgotten outpost of the Roman Empire had on a world based on one action done on a lonely hill that no one really cared about, and yet he influenced the entire world for 2,000 years, I beg you, consider him. Come to know him. And if you do know him, I beg you, consider making him the paradigm of all of your engagement. And this can be a different place. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your son, for his words to tell us to live self-sacrificially, to do unto others as we would have done unto us. I pray, Lord, that we actually do unto others as we would have done unto us. That we see people not as their ideas, but as people made in your image, and that we can disagree with ideas, and maybe even not value ideas, but always hold human beings in infinite value as you have done, as you demonstrated by paying an infinite price for our salvation. May we know you better. May we talk about you more. May we be inspired by not only your words, but your deeds. We pray these things in the name of your son. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you.